break with on the visual in 30 seconds. So, this is the panel that's entitled Researching Racial Violence, Methods, Themes, and Teaching. The panelists um, are Susan Ashmore, Professor of History at Oxford College at Emory University. <laughs> And then Woodruff, Professor of African American Studies at Penn State University. This is getting feedback. Would you better if I take it off? Turn it off? Oh, maybe it's in competition with that? I see. Well, let me see if I can scream. Maybe I'll turn this off. It's a little bit better. Okay, terrific. Great, thanks, Brian. That's why we have a circle around this. Uh, so, uh, in my, I'm Melissa Nobles, a professor of political science at MIT, and um, one of the co-founders of this uh, project, along with Professor Burnham, though it's largely uh, Professor Burnham's um, project at Northeastern University. But a big part of this, uh, so I thought I would begin first by saying a bit about how we came to this project, not talking in too much detail about methods, but giving you a sense of how we do what we do, then have uh, Susan and Dan speak in turn, and then we'll open up for, for questions and, uh, and, com and conversation discussion. So the project is largely rests on our ability to actually locate cases. At some level, it's much more than quantification, but it begins with um, a data set. And, um, when we first started this back now 10 years ago, there was a conference that was held at Northeastern Law School looking at the civil rights periods. So this would be the 1960s, and looking at cold cases during that time. And not surprisingly, there are many cases which, for all, of, for all that has been written about the civil rights movement, it's still, um, I think, an understudied period as regards to violence and, um, and how violence might factor into how we tell the story of the civil rights movement. But even with that, uh, Margaret and I realized that the period prior to the civil rights movement, that would be the 40s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, was also understudied, and particularly understudied by those scholars, uh, principally sociologists and some political scientists, who were concerned with the basic scale of violence. Uh, in fact, there's one book that had been written, um, it's really kind of a groundbreaking book, published in the mid-1995, uh, 1995, um, a Festival of Violence and Analysis of Southern Lynchings, 1882 to, to 1930, which was published by two sociologists, Stuart Tone and um, Ian Beck. And in that book, they uh, studied lynchings from 19, the late um, 1800s, 1880, after, this, after, after Reconstruction, till 1930. And they basically used three uh, sources of information. All basically newspaper newspaper clippings, some provided by the Tuskegee Institute, some also that uh, the, uh, the um, Chicago Tribune newspaper began to use, uh, uh, um, uh, began to track lynchings and the NAACP. They drew up those, drew up a database based on those news clippings, cooperated to make sure that the lynchings did in fact happen, and that's the basis of their database, which ends in 1930. And they make an argument from the database. So they run a series of statistical regressions, and they find that what best explains lynchings has to do with uh, content, content cultivation. That perhaps counterintuitively, as counter as counter cotton was needed to be cultivated, lynchings increased. You would think, why would you do that? So the idea was to keep people from fleeing the South, right? So you would use extremely coercive methods in order to keep people on the land. Well, eventually. Um, uh, they they stop they the the lynchings they claim stop in 1930 because blacks as we all know begin to leave the south right the great migration out in part because of the violence um, but really by stop, stopping in 1930 it is more an assertion than an argument since there is no data after 1930 they don't count to see if there were actually decreasing violence after 1930 so it's an assertion without any data and we thought well. Actually, maybe something is going on in the 1930s and 40s. Right? Not only Robin scholarship he's heard about, but many people um, uh, uh, suspected 
that there was a, 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 a continuing of violence even after, uh, even after the period of the study. So, um, in order, it seems to me, for us to make this database that we're putting together most useful, not only for the public, which is obviously very important, but also for scholars. Right? Since the Beck and Tomei database to this day is the only thing that at least the scholars who are doing work on lynchings focus on because it's considered to be the most reliable database, but it obviously has the strengths, the first being that it stops in 1930. So, we thought that it would be as important to bring that database forward Right, to bring it forward into the 30s, and 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, so that we begin to get a much longer view of the nature of violence in the American South. And, um, and so that's what motivates us. Okay, you know what? Okay, I'm just going to scream. <laughs> we hear you. I hear you. Okay, fine, great. So, we start, we decided that um, you know, bring it forward to the 19 to the 1970s um, as a way of, of getting a much, as I said, much longer longitudinal study of the nature of violence um, and building a reliable database. Um, but we use in certain ways the same methods that Beck and Tony have used, and indeed that Ida B. Wells used, that um, that the NAACP used, the Chicago Tribune used. We begin with newspaper articles. But thankfully, in this, in the 21st century, we have a lot of digital tools that are at our disposal that weren't, that wasn't the case back when, even in the late 1990s, when Beck and Tony was doing their work. So we start first with a newspaper account. Literally, is law students at, um, at Northeastern Law School are giving a newspaper clipping. Um, sometimes there is some other evidence, other documents that are coming with it, sometimes not. And the students have the responsibility basically running it down, running the, um, the documents down. By the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there's a much richer uh, documentary evidence. We have the NAACP papers, we have the DOJ eventually, we have the FBI, we have Ancestry.com that can easily help you find death certificates. There's a lot at our disposal. And we, we are now beginning to construct and add in a way that's much richer, I think, than any other database that exists. Not simply the newspaper clipping and the fact that the murder happened, but all of the facts surrounding it as best as we can be constructed. Um, and which includes, of course, oral histories and getting in touch with families. So it's a much richer base database, and our hope is that we can, with this, we can better understand what distinguishes the Jim Crow period from the civil rights period from and now the post-civil rights period, but also what unites it. So we have a, and at the same time, keeping our focus on the individual uh, victims' cases, the circumstances of those cases as well, and the relationships, obviously, with families and communities, and then most broadly, at the end, what does it tell us about the nature of American democracy or in its, in its failings, um, and the, the, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of law. So um, that's what motivated us, that's what keeps us going, and at the end of the day, it is what we hope will be one of the longest and lasting legacies, which is to get the stories told in a, in a range of dimensions. But one of the most important, I think, that we can bring to bear is getting this into, uh, into a shape where scholars and educators can use it, and then that way we can get the word out through education um, so that it has a certain security in the way that we begin to retell our country's history. Um, so that's what we do, and you're a, you know um, you're a big part of that. Uh, this this uh, workshop today is an important part of our ongoing efforts to make this happen. And um, at the end of the day, um, I think um, I'm confident in what we're finding, and also I must say, always quite depressed with every case that comes through, because every one of them is its own individual upsetting. It's something obscene that tells us about the failure of law, about the human depravity. Yes, each case has its own horror. Um, and, um, and I know Professor Bird and I always go through that every time we see, um, we um, investigate, investigate the case. So, with that, I'd like to introduce our two, um, our two speakers. I think we're going to go in the order of the, of the program. So Susan Ashmore will begin, and then we'll end up with Dan, and we'll come back to the question. 
I haven't, excuse me, I haven't given you a lot of fees. I think they were in the program, so I thought it was the time. Yeah, they're they're online. Online. Be with, they're oh. online. So just to save time and such, I thought we might have it. Um, at the end, I wanted to show some things, some student work that students have done. And if, in case we don't have time there, I'm not showing it to me. But um, this book is available if anyone wants to sort of flip through and see uh, some of the things that my students have done with their own, own work. So that's just there.
uh, who, who really is qualified and how those that we sometimes as a culture, as a nation, assume are not qualified are really the ones that are qualified to be having a say. And so uh, Stokely says civil rights protest has not materially benefited the masses of Negroes. It has helped those who were already just a little ahead. The main result of that protest has been an opening up of the society to Negroes who have one of their criteria for upward mobility. The South is not some odd, unique corner of this nation. It is super America. The Negro is not some minority group, but a microcosm of the excluded. The three criteria for upward mobility aptly, brutally, apply brutally to black and white everywhere. Education is one major form and means of exclusion. Politics is another. The Southern Negro has been shamed into distrusting his own capacity to grow and lead and articulate. He has been shamed from birth by his skin, his poverty, his ignorance, and even his speech. When Smith first, came, first went to work in Lowndes County, Alabama, the people asked if something different could be created. They wanted to redefine politics, make up new rules, and play the game with some personal integrity. Out of a negative force, fear, grew the positive drive to think new. The Alabamans had known what kind of way they wanted to take. They needed to be given confidence and to be told how to do it. Alabama Negroes are beginning to believe they don't need to be qualified to get involved in politics. The status quo persists because there are no ways up from the bottom. When improvements within the system have been made, they resulted from pressure, pressure from below. Nothing has been given away. Governments don't hand out justice because it's a nice thing to do. People must struggle and die first. Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, and in the county where I am working, Mrs. Viola Lauzo and Jonathan Dent. Excluded people must acquire the opportunity to redefine what the great society is. And then it may have meaning. I place my own hope for the U.S. in the growth of belief among the unqualified that they are in fact qualified. They can articulate and be responsible and hold power. So that is a really nice context in thinking of 1966. What then, if I look at what happens after the Voting Rights Act passed in the Alabama Black Belt, there is some part of this history around Birmingham and Jefferson County and their attempts to try to get a war on poverty program and how George Wallace intercedes and keeps that from happening. But mainly what um, you'll see today are, are, is from this Black Belt area. And so um, Virginia Durr, if you know Virginia Durr from Montgomery, <laughs> Uh, C. Dunn Woodward had written an article in Harper's Magazine about how the Civil Rights Movement was kind of what happened to the Civil Rights Movement. And Virginia Durr writes him back to tell him what she thinks is happening here. And so it's a, a kind of a bookend to Stokely Carmichael's uh, quotes as well. I think the great mass demonstrations are over, but all of this has left in its way a new spirit and a new determination on the part of the Negro to get their due as Americans. It has come to the nitty gritty. And on the local levels, there are fights going on all the time. And so uh, my work, the big issues, I wanted to just highlight. I'm sorry, this is so much reading, but it's, I don't have a lot of time, and I wanted to be able to give you an overview. Uh, and so there are some larger issues that my book, Carried On, talks about. The, the nitty gritty, I love that phrase because it really gets it down into, into the body. So I'm looking at the crucial years after 1965 to see how much changed and how much did not after the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act passed. In this day, crucial to the Civil Rights Movement, instead of a triumphal climax of Selma, of the Selma March, the book reveals the realities of white supremacy after Jim Crow sides are taken down and the divisions within the black community that grew more significant in these years. The book also offers a way to consider black power in a rural, deep south context, revealing the reach of the civil rights movement through 
people not thought of as intellectuals, who had a clear understanding of justice, democracy, and civil human rights. Where does black power come from in this context? What does it mean to be political? What encompasses politics in the United States? Beyond elections to also include policy and its implementation. Who benefits? Who participates? Who decides? Evidence and an intellectual understanding all the way to the folks on the bottom row. Summed up in a big, a big question, who gets to be a citizen? The other big issues are just ways to evaluate the Johnson administration's Office of Economic Opportunity in the War on Poverty. An extensive look at OEO on the ground provides a way to see how civil rights activists involve politically to alter and change a place like the Alabama Black Belt. Before this book, most studies of OEO focused on urban programs or the child development group in Mississippi. And most evaluated OEO as a failure, but a deeper look reveals more nuance. Yes, there were lots of problems. But how did OEO programs enable ways to confront older parts of the federal government, especially the Department of Agriculture? <coughs> what was the result of the confrontations that OEO created? It uh, became an opportunity for civic education, or a college of experience, as Carmichael's unqualified. And an assessment of OEO in one state, what worked and what didn't. So I'm really curious about what happens in Alabama after the Selma March, which tends to be the triumphal ending, when it is not the case. The book reveals the reality of white supremacy after the segregation signs are gone. And it's a way to think about black power in a rural setting instead of a uh, West Coast California large city setting. And the significance of the federal government's power over the state in a crucial job. So there's a lot that's going on in the book, but it's uh, really highlighting the lives of people uh, who were in these rural places, had a political understanding, and were trying to change their uh, region, their towns, or their cities, or their freedom. So I wanted you to see some photographs from Francis Walter's collection. Jonathan Daniels is murdered and he was part of an Episcopal organization that was trying to bring uh, support to the Civil Rights Movement, and so Francis Walter took his place. He was there actually when Jonathan was murdered, because he was going to make the transition. And so Francis creates the Selma Interreligious Project, and he was involved in helping create the uh, Freedom of Social Media. And so these are some photographs from his collection that I thought would like to see, and then there are some photographs from my own uh, that I've taken myself. So most of you know where the Black Belt is, but uh, just useful to see the map. So this is uh, the Alabama River from the Jeeves Bend Ferry from the top. And this is from the Edmund Pettus Bridge, so it's like linking that whole area there in the Black Belt. The original Freedom Quilting Bee headquarters. This quilt from Mrs. Williams, it's probably hard to see, but all of those little words say the word vote over and over and over. So she made this quilt. It just was like a speaking out from the walls of the exhibit. This is Francis.
it leads to the creation eventually of the Southwest Farmer, Southwest Alabama Farmer Cooperative that covered 10 Black Mountain counties and was supported by OEO. This was the Witherspoon's home, and from the results of the quilting bee, they were able to build a new home. Uh, so this was their, where they lived before. And you can see their outhouse from the, from the barn perspective. Adventure Plantation uh, is where a group uh, where the Moors were living, but they will also be involved in a lawsuit that goes all the way to the Supreme Court. But by the time that the Supreme Court rules, most of the people had been thrown off the land and it was too hard to be able to sustain their living while this case was making it through the courts. So that's another place where we can see a, maybe that's like a slow version of violence take so long and you still uh, don't get the justice even though Supreme Court justices are hearing your case. So this was the commissary. This was uh, a surprise that the chalk was still on the chalkboard, but the, um, this is where all the mail would come and the landowner also handled the post office. So he could keep food stamps from people, he could maintain his power in that way. And so you can see that here. It's a cotton gin fan. And this, you can imagine there were some sharecropper houses on this land before it's gone now.
she found him and called him. And so she created uh, her presentation. And it's very interesting because she seems to be, she was very understanding about forgiveness, but at the same time, she had a really nice uh, conclusion. I'll show it to you. But you can see how the program enables you to put in the full quotes and add various um, other ways to highlight. This is really, what is our future when law permits the murder of our children? And this was a, a, a drawing she found that a child had created of the nine who were killed at the uh, church. Yeah, I think it's just the last paragraph I wanted you to see. So she says here, as blacks move through history in a constant attempt to fight for their equality as promised by the law, they were continuously met with opposition from their white counterparts. Much of this opposition came in the form of violent physical attacks on blacks, whether it be killings or severe beatings. In response to these terrible things, blacks often found it in their hearts to forgive felt as though it was a great way to help heal their soul of the pain they had experienced. By forgiving, they were able to let go of the anger cultivated by the actions of the whites as well, as strengthened their determination to keep on fighting for what is right. In recent times, it has been questioned whether American, America even deserves black forgiveness anymore. After years of offering forgiveness and receiving the same results continuously, what is the point? I feel as though black forgiveness is important because it gives character and class to the black community that their white harassers just do not have. I feel like it points out perfectly how even when being victimized, blacks still remain respectable. However, I feel that in order to seek change, more needs to be done along with the offering of forgiveness. I feel as though things should not just stop after forgiveness is granted. It should be a stronger movement that is created in order to try to propel the evils out. America does not deserve black forgiveness because, as Senator Graham pointed out, that was a state senator, a relative of one of uh, Forgiveness should only be given when asked for. And since America is not making any attempts to change its ways or asking to be forgiven, America is not worthy of black forgiveness. America decides that it is willing to admit their wrongdoings and ask for forgiveness, then it shall be given eventually. However, there should also be a more aggressive approach to combating the evils that have been living in America for centuries. So sophomore in college, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, I, I don't want to take up more time. I know we're a little bit behind and Dr. Woodruff is next, but um, and maybe in the question time we can talk more. But, this really provides students with a way to, to really express themselves and to, to, to connect today with the past, which I think they're really searching for. So.
I am confident that the American Congo because of the violence in the Delta matched the terror that reigned in the Belgian Congo. Torture, rape, disappearances, and theft of people's property were commonplace and carried out with impunity. After finishing that book, I came to wonder about the legacies of living in communities where the perpetrators were never held accountable for their crimes and where the victims continued to live amongst and confront their torturers, rapists, murderers, and thieves who had inflicted harm upon their families. These questions led me to my work on the Native Mississippi Freedom Movement, where in 1966, one of the most violent desegregations of the public schools occurred. Through all histories of the participants and archival sources, we learned how the former children and their families had understood their involvement in this historic event, and of how they had both remembered and forgotten their experiences, and of how the refusal of the city of Grenada to confront its violent past continues to resonate in the political and social life of the community. It is a story of the ordinary men, women, and children who form the backbone of the freedom movement. It's an effort to understand the impact of that participation in their lives. The desegregation of the Grenada Public Schools rivaled Little Rock in the degree of violence inflicted upon the children in the black community. The local white community's massive resistance to desegregation was part of a larger response to an emerging civil rights movement one that had gained momentum in the summer of 1966 when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference entered Grenada to work with the local people and to organize a mass action campaign against segregation and disfranchisement that lasted for several months. Next slide. Mm -hmm. My sister needs to come back. <laughs> Crowds of three to 600 people marched almost every night in the summer on the town square where they confronted equally large numbers of jeering white people. The majority of marchers were teenagers and children as young as five years old, while mothers and grandmothers formed the remainder. The nonviolent marches and protests were met by racist mobs, backed up by excessive police force and mass arrests. Mobs launched with slingshots, steel ball bearings, one and a half inches in diameter that struck children and adults alike. Others threw firecrackers under the marchers' feet. On some occasion, officers used tear gas to disperse the marchers, leaving the square scattered with hundreds of shoes as people fled. State troopers trampled on an outspoken leader of the movement, 14-year-old Emerald Cunningham, who was unable to run due to polio. While on other occasions, one of the merchants, who also had polio, came out of his store, knocked down Emma, and kicked her braces. Members of the mob rode through black neighborhoods, firing guns into houses, or stopped young black pedestrians, forcing them into their trucks, and threatening to kill them. Other young people suffered major lacerations thrown from objects, uh, as seen here with Amy Kimball on the right, she had to go to the hospital there with a severe cut in her head, where broken bones were being beaten with chains and clubs. Next slide. The violence of the summer foretold the horrors of the false desegregation of the public schools when 250 African American children faced a white mob of several hundred people as they integrated the Lizzie Horn Elementary and John Mundell Hospitals in Grenada. The mob consisted of teenage boys, grown men, and many women, some of them members of the Ku Klux Klan who had traveled to Grenada from all over Mississippi and nearby states, including here at Birmingham to forcibly prevent its desegregation. The mob brandished pipes, bricks, tire chains, coke bottles, and axe handles as the children leaped towards the schools. Small Roman bands circled the school, guided by local talkies that communicated where the children were, while others fired gunshots into the, to signal the location of the students. A white woman drove a pickup truck while guiding several men and children on the back where to throw bottles at the kids. One group of girls walked together as men yelled and chased them. They all went away leaving 14-year-old Emma Cunningham, who I just mentioned, who suffered from polio and so couldn't run. At least 10 grown men beat Emma with fists, pipes, and chains. One man pointed a gun to her head, pushed her into the front yard, and said, Nigger, you move, I shoot your brains out. Local policemen stood by and grinned, refusing appeals from the terrified children for help. The mob also crushed the windshield of a 
pregnant woman bringing children to school. When she stepped out of the car, Constable Greg Carroll, who had been watching the incident, told her, don't get your ass out of that car. If you do, we'll kill you. Governor Paul Johnson had ordered the Highway Patrol to Grenada, but they didn't arrive until Monday night, and upon the request of the local police, did not move into the school area until Tuesday morning. And all 33 youngsters and three newsmen were beaten on that Monday. Now, the preceding account is based on newspaper reports, and as horrible as these accounts are, they don't begin to capture the savagery and terror that these young people and their families encounter. Federal trial transcripts and personal interviews with both the children and the families describe the sheer horror that people encounter as well as the lasting and at times devastating consequences. For example, when Felix Freelon, Freelon drove his daughter Diana, who's at the forefront of this picture on the, on the right, Diana drove Diana and his son Billy to school with three other children that September morning. The mob surrounded his car, the children jumped out, and the men shattered the back windshield. Diana, walking toward the school, watched in fear as a man pulled a gun next slide, on 17-year-old Charles Alexander and clicked it. Once the children entered the high school, the principal called all of the white students to his office and sent them home at lunchtime. He then called all of the black students to the front of the building and told them to go home, locking the door behind them. As the children walked out, the mob of over 300 people moved in and attacked them. The students ran as fast as they could, but Poindexter Harvey fell behind and the mob moved in and beat him severely. Diana turned to her friend Dorothy Jean Allen, saying that they must run back and help Poindexter. Dorothy Jean insisted that they keep moving. Diana dropped her school books and ran back to Poindexter. At that point, a man hit Diana in the head with a brick and she fell to the ground. Dorothy then went back to get Poindexter and pulled him up from the ground. In the commotion, Lillian Ann Mitchell, the other student in the group, helped Diana to her feet. Then the four continued walking a few blocks back to the Bell Park Church where the SCLC field staff and parents awaited them. As they walked, a man hit all four of them in the back with a large tree limb and one Dexter fell once again to the ground. One man yelled to another, get that little bitch, as he hit Dorothy Jean in the face with a tree branch, completely blinding her. Finally, the teenagers made it back to the Bell Park Church, blood streaming out their bodies. Meanwhile, 10 year old, meanwhile, 10 men, grown men, beat 13 year old Richard Side with axe handles, knocking him down to the ground, stomped, kicked, and twisted his leg, breaking it in four places. The men yelled, kick that nigger, stomp that nigger, kill that nigger. Finally, Sheriff Suggs Ingram slowly soldered over and pulled the men off the bloody child. The U.S. Attorney General filed a lawsuit against the city of Grenada for failing to protect his children by refusing to restrain the mob and for standing by while the children were attacked. The federal judge in nearby Oxford closed the public schools for one day, allowing for the officials to appear in federal court. He then issued an injunction ordering the protection of the children, and the FBI arrested 13 men on conspiracy charges for organizing the attack on the children. And Constable Grady Carroll was immediately sentenced to four months in jail for beating a lawyer who had attempted to serve him with a subpoena. I might add that when these men were tried in the summer, uh, none of them were convicted. For the next few weeks, about, uh, wait a minute, let's see, I'll get the next slide. Yeah, Dr. King sees a very iconic photograph on the right. Dr. King and John Baez, as uh, you can see her on the right. Uh, because of extraordinary violence, uh, the SCLC, uh, SCLC staff called him. He's at that time in Chicago organizing for the Fair Housing uh, Act that's about to come up in Congress. And he returns and uh, takes these little children to school the next day. For the next few weeks, about 150 students attend school. By mid-October, over half of the students have been driven out of school by physical attacks and harassment by students, teachers, and principals while many had received the merits for supposed misbehavior. For example, the principal at Lizzie Horn had slapped several students and continued to refer to them as niggers, while teachers ignored the students and flunked them on the class world. 
These conditions prompted several mothers to visit the principals of both schools and to insist on meetings with the teachers. The principals refused, and the kids walked out of all the black and white schools. Six days later, over 2,200 black students had refused to attend classes. When the students marched in town during the boycott to protest the classroom conditions, the police arrested over 200 of them, along with several SCLC organizers. They were loaded on cattle tr trucks with fresh manure in the floors and taken to the notorious Parksburg prison. The very young children were released that evening, but the others remained in jail for a week. Officers told the young boys to strip off their clothes, <coughs> forcing the girls to watch. Highway patrolmen and local police pulled off their badges and beat four SCLC staff so severely that some never recovered. And one of them was 19-year-old Robert Johnson, who was a native related, and he had just gone to Alcorn A&M uh, on a football scholarship, and he had come back to participate uh, in the movement, and he was singled out and beaten severely every day for that week and then forced to mop up his own blood. In early November, a federal judge ordered an end to the boycott and sent all the students back to school. He also ordered the school superintendent to set up meetings with parents and to create a process for dealing with complaints. In the end, the majority of students either returned to their former schools or dropped out altogether. The pain of remembering the events of 1966 has been evident in the interviews conducted with the participants. Individuals and families buried deep within themselves the memory of these traumatic events. Several didn't recall testifying at the federal trial, even though we have transcripts of their accounts and of the violence they experienced, testimonies that were prolonged because the lawyers constantly challenged them. For example, Diana Freelon, the young girl who went back to pick up Point Dexter Harvey, once he had been knocked down as he came out of the school, told me that her father had testified in the federal court case. However, the transcript revealed that she was a witness as well. She had suppressed any memory of that testimony. I brought the transcript to her office one day, to the community organizer, and I asked if she had been able to testify. She replied, no. We sat around the table. That's amazing, she said, as we read along. Because I can't remember this. I don't know if, if it's deliberate, subconscious. I remember the day of the testimony very well. I remember my father going, but I can't remember going myself. Nor did she remember getting hit in the back of her head with a brick. I can't believe this. I mean, she, my mother, has reminded me I had gotten hit. Daddy said it to me. She then read her father's testimony that described him driving back to pick them up at the school that first day when they had been thrown into the mob. The defense attorney reminds Mr. Freelon that he had turned his car around when he saw the mob leaving his kids to fend for themselves. When she got to this part of the testimony, she stopped and looked straight ahead for a moment or two. She then said softly, when I read that, I put it down. I'm older now. And I understand fear more in terms of being afraid. We were let out early and got back to the church. They knew, my parents, we were okay. They knew the civil rights workers would take care of us. Those are the kinds of things you have to come to terms with, she said. Daddy was afraid he was to not be a part of the movement. Diana, unlike others, graduated high school and left her later for several years. She finished college, married, and had three children. But the experiences of those days continued to weigh heavily upon her. One of her most haunting memories is that of the principal throwing the children out of school, locking the door behind them, and throwing them to the mob. That immense remains with her, as she explained, because you can't understand why adults are being children in a nation where children are supposed to be held sacred as valuable resources. How can a human being do such a thing? She shakes her head. We were children. For years she saw the principal of local restaurants and he never acknowledged her. She often wondered if he even knew who she was. Shirley saw Watt sitting in her living room in Detroit with her brother Richard. We call the day, uh, not yet. 
I don't have a picture of her, I'm sorry. She recalled the day she as an eight-year-old walked out of Lizzie Horn with her brother. I remember that day as if it was yesterday. We came out together. We went out and there were white people on both sides of the sidewalk and they had umbrellas and sticks and I thought, we have to go through this? And then people said, run, niggers, run, we're going to kill us some niggers today. And all of a sudden, she continued, they all called on Richard. I had never been in that side of the neighborhood in my life. I didn't know where it was. And all I knew, I was running down the street and Miss Essie May drove by and picked me up. When Shirley got home and told her father and mom was speaking, Richard, Mr. Sight, a big man, picked up a gun and headed out to find Richard, created even more trauma for Shirley as she feared her father would be killed. Shirley wept as she recounted her story while Richard shook his head and hung at times. I realized later that he had never heard his little sister describe that September day. Shirley settled down a bit and then crying again said, I have never wanted to go back to that place ever in life. I then asked her if she had ever returned to Grenada. She stops crying and gathers herself and says that in the 1990s her husband went with her and together they revisited the school and the surrounding area. She recalled trying to compose herself, I had to walk that stretch. I had to go back to it and it was good to go back crying again, just to see how in the world people can do that to people just because of the color of their skin. It never made sense to me. It was all because we were black. Her father moved his family to Detroit within weeks of desegregation, saying that if he remained, he might kill some white people. I later found out they were run out of town. But I think he would kill some white people too. Okay, now it's so Vasilia Cunningham recalled walking out of school at eight years old with her big sister Emerald, who was beaten by the mob, and being surrounded by mobs of white men who kicked and beat her sister with polio. Others in the mob grabbed and beat Facilia, eventually pulling off all of her new school clothes that her sister in New Jersey had sent to her. She ran away as Emma told her to and feels guilty to this day for leaving her behind. I was never the same after that day, she recalls. I loved school, was a good student. After that, I hated school. Dropped out because the teachers were so mean to us. Cecilia left the native, eventually became a public school teacher in Atlanta, and continued to suffer from anger and depressed memories of that day. She said her family never spoke of those events, not even Emma, and that she felt isolated, eventually seeking psychiatric help. She had nightmares where she was constantly running from something horrible, and she had no face in this dream. I am always spaceless, she said. I lost myself. Parents of the children who integrated the schools, like, like Diana, struggled to remember painful events. I interviewed Mrs. Flora Ingram, a mother whose four children had both integrated the schools and testified at the federal trial while she herself had confronted the principal of the racist treatment of the children. He had slapped her seven-year-old daughter, among other things. She had agreed to see me only at Diana Freeland's request. She opened the screen door with a tense face and greeted me curtly by telling me she had just gotten off from work and had been up all night due to the thunderstorm. She clearly did not want to speak with me and I asked if she would like to do it another time. She mumbled a few words and finally said that since I was there, we might as well get home with it. As I tried to explain my project, she became agitated, but she told me to continue. I asked her if I might read a copy of her testimony at the federal trial on that of her three children. She agreed, but as I read the testimony, she became angry, insisting that her children did not testify and that the federal transcript represented all lies made up by white people when she used stronger language than that. I then asked her if, I, if she recalled testifying, and she said yes. Then I asked if she remembered Mary Wright Adelman for the testimony, testimony, and she replied no. She then allowed that one of her children had testified, but not all three, and she denied that they had ever missed a day of school, referring to the testimony regarding the boycott that she herself had played the role in organizing. She was very uh, active. She then went on to say that her children did not talk like that, referring to the incorrect grammar of the transcript. I tried to suggest that a federal transcript would be hard to tinker with, but she was not persuaded. 
She was a single mother, never married, and the lawyer, uh, during her testimony, tried to make her look like an unfit mother. Uh, and I suspect they had investigated her history. Mrs. Ingram had moved her children to a Midwestern city the winter after they had entered the schools. She insisted that she had intended to move all along, but had wanted them to be part of the integration of the schools. What she did not tell me was that the county sheriff had come to her house and told her that she didn't leave town, and she and her children would be killed. She gathered her children, her own. She gathered her children, and her own parents came and drove them in the still of the night to catch a train that carried them to Iowa. Like thousands before her, Mrs. Ingram had fled violence and terror through the modern day underground railroad. Many silences and much pain surrounds the history of the desegregation and summer events. Silences within black families where no one discussed the struggle once it had ended, where many young people left, where young men went off to Vietnam, where others suffered mental breakdowns, and where still others moved on as best they could. Their stories reveal the personal trauma that people endured over time and the ways that they have coped with the memories of those violent episodes. These stories reveal the disappointment and anger that many experienced when the movement ended, leaving many without decent jobs in a white community that sought to erase the civil rights struggle and their own violent resistance to it. Others still continue to fear retribution or feel pain and suffering from rapes by local law enforcement who continue to roam freely in the community. Let me just say this, because I don't have time, but the police in Grenada, and I think this is true in most southern communities, are sexual predators. And the stories that women tell uh, are horrendous. Perhaps part of the anger and trauma also derives from the forgetting that occurred within families where these events were not discussed after the desegregation was over. For example, Diana insists that her family did not discuss the events of 1966 until she was much older. How did we lose this history, she wondered. For many, the civil rights struggle had not necessarily succeeded in part because the perpetrators were not held accountable and because of the racism and inequality that remained in the later. Perhaps the memory was too, fain too painful, leading family members to silence their own participation in the movement, but also the, the violence that followed 1966 in that town was extraordinary. People were afraid. Grenada represents a community then whose history weighs heavily upon the present and where a willful ignorance of the Grenada Freedom Movement and the desegregation and the corresponding <coughs> massive resistance continues to shape the political and social life of that city. As Diana Freelon observed, silence is a testament to white resistance. But the legacies of the freedom struggle continue to resonate in Grenada in ways that may not be discernible to most people. In 2005, Diana was elected mayor when the white vote divided over two candidates. While the black community celebrated, white people mobilized to ask her by successfully securing a federal de-annexation plan that brought the white suburbs back into the city to elect a white mayor. Mind you, the mayor's position is largely ceremonial, yet the white establishment could not tolerate her as mayor. Her term lasted for less than a year. To conclude, studies of historical trauma have become popular in the humanities in recent years. However, trauma resulting from racial violence holds a relatively small place in that field. We need to recognize the ways that the history of racism, violence, and terror continue to resonate in the lives of individuals, families, and communities. We celebrate, as we should, the remarkable heroism of the civil rights movement. But we have ignored the consequences of that heroism for the working class people who were the backbone of that famous struggle. We need to remember the depth of sacrifice of those who live with everyday injustices of white supremacy and who risk everything to bring it down and who continue to live with the consequences of those traumatic experiences. It is a trauma that comes in many forms and refusing to sit with one's back to the door or awaken in the night with memories of a horrible incident and broken marriages and families, and drug addiction, mental illness, and post-traumatic stress. And for community organizers like Diana Freelon, the trauma of 1966 continues to resonate in the educational and criminal justice system that she has worked so hard to change. Indeed, the persistence of systemic racism is a reminder just how long and hard the struggle for racial equality has and continues to be. The Grenada story transcends local and regional history, for it raises questions about an American narrative that continues to ignore history rooted in state violence and terror, 
and the legacies of racism and inequality that flow from that history, and that resonate in our system that resonate in systemic racism in our criminal justice system and in our educational system. It is a history of struggle, pain, resistance, and resource, resourcefulness that we cannot afford to forget. And finally, our understanding of U.S. history changes when we center state violence and the terror it created. For violence underwrote white supremacy, no matter the face it has worn for 400 years of its existence. Whether it was slavery, Jim Crow, or the new face of white massive resistance that emerged after 1968 in the form of the new Republican Party of neoliberalism, state violence has remained at the center of white supremacy. Once we center violence in the American historical narrative, we may then pose new questions about the meaning of democracy and citizenship in this country. Thank you.
But those sheriffs and those constables, just like here in Birmingham, they were only in power because those million class black folks let them stay in there. Thank you. And so I don't Thank think you. we need to stick this on poor white working class people. They were there, they were involved in violence, but let's understand whose violence they were doing, who they were doing it for. It's because they did the dirty work. And I love what the sheriff said, that, that the police were the, light, the legs, what do you say? The legs of Jim Crow. Yeah. Hey, I was just talking to because that's exactly right. But they, who was Jim Crow and the power? It's the power structure. So I just want to, I can't let that go. Thank you. Another thing at that time, I, I think want to ask you questions. You want to follow up or? This is a brief statement. Okay. I'm going to do this all day. <laughs> you know, all these school systems were on a court order of immigration that might have helped the situation. They were in court. Right. Every school system in the whole state of Alabama was on a court order of immigration. Right. That would be true of Grenada, too. Right. It was a court order of Grenada. Mm -hmm. Hi, I just want to follow up on, on the remark there. You mentioned, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, that in the corners, wonderful carry me home. And the point she makes, which, which I think a lot of us observe firsthand, is that the, the, the significance of the white power structure was they owned the businesses, they owned the factories, and they owned. And so what they, the main thing they did that we're all paying for is that in order not to have unions in the South, they convinced working class white people that working class black people were their enemies because God help them if they got together and realized they had much more in common with each other than they would have had with with these other people. The other thing I think the income difference was, um, and I saw this in, in my own growing up, is that the higher income white people felt like they could be, and this is my own interpretation, felt like they could be more liberal. It never dawned on them they could compete with a white person. You know, I mean, when I went to law school, I'm not sure we had anybody white in law school. We didn't have a handful of women. So I mean, one one thing, and this is kind of a cynical thing to say, but I think it may have occurred to them that you know they could afford to be a little more Christian and all this stuff because they were going to have to, you know, working class people had to wonder, is this guy going to take my job? And of course, that was a lot of the virulence of it. But upper class people never had, certainly not in my day, upper class people didn't have to worry about the black person taking your job, whether we admitted it or not. Another question that I'm going to ask you about. My question is how you chose to be a neighbor. I live about 100 miles from Boston together. Where are you from? Uh, Porto. Porto. There are people all over there. They're born there. And uh, how did I go to school? I'm a black children. I don't know how to integrate this school. We had a black school and we had a white school. So you went to our top school in most days before I got here. And uh, my last 13 months.
uh, were churches more likely, depending on the, uh, the time of the year, was there a, 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 a relationship between time of the year and lynchings? It had to do with the, the nature of the supposed crime. Did it help? You know, was that rape or something else? Alleged rapes or such led to lynchings. Uh, did it have to do with um, the, uh, they didn't really look at political factors, um, ironically. Um, and, uh, and so when they ran these directions, what they found was that the one factor, the one variable that seems to predict more than any other, whether lynchings would happen, would be during the time of year. And the time of year had to do with cotton cultivation. Um, so it was suggested the economic basis of lynchings. Right? But the counterintuitive part of that right, is that lynchings would happen when the cotton needs to be cultivated because they wanted to keep laborers on the land. Right? So one of the ways that you keep people on the land is that you lynch people to think about leaving. But eventually that became kind of counterproductive because people did leave. Right? And once they began to leave, hence the, the Great Migration. So there seems to be, according to this book, um, uh, what they describe as a fairly significant decline in the after 1930, meaning by that point, blacks had left the South and enough numbers were just beginning to show matter demographically, and so lynchings decrease. And so that's, they don't argue that violence disappears completely, but rather um, uh, people realize when well, you can't really lynch your workforce, right? You have to, you know, kind of the, the, the economics of it such that that's the argument. But what we what, what we think is that there isn't really an argument because we don't, since there are no data collected after 1930, we don't know if the violence actually decreased. And it is our findings, I'm going to say this preliminarily, that it didn't decrease. Right? It may, well, it decreased, but it didn't decrease at, at, the, um, at the rate that their argument suggests. Right? They suggest that it kind of drops off, falls off. And I think that, so we've been thinking about a slope. The slope is a lot less steep than they suggest. It's more graduated. And that and perhaps, um, and so our question is, why is it happening? Why is lynching happening? If their argument is that it's connected to cotton cultivation, perhaps it doesn't hold up in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, why lynching is happening. And by lynching, I mean it's kind of a term of art. They're basically talking about illegal violence, murders. And that's what our work is about. And what makes it different than these scholars is that because the documentary record is so much fuller, right, we have all of these papers, we have actually, um, in a certain case, about the 50s, we have actually survivors or people. We have a much richer record to go on and to really explain. Right? So, you know, we all know Michelle Anderson, Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. But I think my, at least my interest is that we don't well understand the old Jim Crow. Right. Right. Um, at least as regards to the violence. And I think that's, and so, you know, we're looking at case by case. And what makes the legal part of this so important is that um, it focuses us on the particular cases. So, so legal methods lend themselves extraordinarily well to the study of this kind of violence. Because at the end of the day, it's one individual telling the story of one victim. We heard the story about one victim at a time. Yeah, I just wanted to, to comment on this. I think your critique is absolutely right. And not only that, but there's a logic that I think they missed in terms of why why um, time picking time. Right. right? And that has, that has less to do with, it has a lot to do with the fact that that was the only time when workers could collectively decide to fight for a high wage. Nicely. Right? And so what happens is that over time, um, the, the worst time to try to organize is during the winter when people are begging for just support to get through the winter. Cotton picking time is the best time to do it. So, of course, it's about organizing. Right. And that's why I think that if you, I don't think that, that it all rests on cotton production, but when you do your research, yes. I think you're going to also find a continuation of forms of violence around cotton picking time. I don't, that's what I found out. That right. When people organize share property, Precisely the time when they try to have a strike. It's always that time mm -hmm. that you could see people get killed, left and right. No one's going to cry. I think the definition of what a mission is, that's why I really appreciate uh, uh, what Josephine said yesterday, that the definition, if it rests on a public event, you have, in the 1930s, you have fewer and fewer public events. Right, right. You know, and so there's still lynchings, and right. the death is 
Right. The same thing why we don't use the, we don't think about lynching as a public event, right? Precisely for that reason. Although that's why I describe it as a kind of term of art, because it really doesn't really describe what we what we're interested in, which are killings and murders. I just wanted to uh, make one point to uh, clarify about the uh, database here. First, sure. supports your claim. Yeah. Um, and Tulna and Beck have been uh, criticized since 1995 mm -hmm. for trying to do a numeric analysis yeah. of lynching. Um, and one of the arguments about numerical analysis is called garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. You can throw any numbers you want into a spreadsheet and run numbers and get results. Yeah. Um, and so I actually have interviewed both of them for a project that we'll talk about later this afternoon. But, um, the other part that is not mentioned is that uh, Dr. Beck keeps a database of threatened lynchings. Mm -hmm. So these were cases where a mob formed, but either uh, the person was held in custody successfully, or the police uh, or the sheriff kept the jail <coughs> secure, or armed resistance. And the numbers of, uh, where people did not die is not exactly, but roughly double. So the numbers we have of lynchings is, is like an undercount by half. Yeah, so they can get the so here's up until 1930. So we are forming, we also, that's one thing I can describe, we also are keeping an inverted lynching database similar to that. Because we do want to know when, 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 it, when it didn't happen, when it perhaps could happen, and what does that tell us about the balance of it. You know, we haven't yet, um, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's going to end up being quite the, the scale that you're suggesting this time, because I was number. Um, but we also will pay attention to that. So, so good. So I didn't know. They haven't talked about that. No, they don't talk about it. They don't talk about that. But you know, you do need to know that because on the one hand, we want to know it for uh, informational and conceptual reasons. Why does it happen, right? Are there certain circumstances in the economy is the way the, the, the uh, is it resistance is the way the political structure is organized? What it, what explains, or is it just a, 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 a brave person who steps in and says they're going to burn it? But, but you know, preacher who comes in and says puts the crowd away, right? What explains these things? It's as important. So it's curious that they have Anyway, more work for us. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Are we up for our time? Are we good for time? Okay. So where is my student? Here, focus. <laughs> some emphasis on, on teaching, and that was a good example that Susan provided us of, of how you teach this. So with that, I want to thank our panelists, Susan and Dan. Thank you very much.